Hello, my name is Stefan Wenning and I want to talk today about creative eco meta gaming as digital documentary practice. Uh, I'm recording this uh, as an unscripted uh, lecture based on the slides that I've been meaning to present uh, during the uh, original uh, lecture time slot. And I want to walk you quickly through what I mean by this relatively dense title, how it links up to uh, concepts and um, definitions of documentary, especially documentary practice, and uh, talk to you about two phenomena of creative eco-meta gaming that I've been studying since around 2019. Very briefly, um, just to give you a bit of context where I'm working at and um, where we um, report on our work. Um, so I am working within the Green Media Studies Initiative at Utrecht University. I put the URL down here. Uh, in the next few months, we will be releasing our uh, anthology on eco-games, playful perspectives on the climate crisis, together with Professor Jost Rasens and two other colleagues. And this is a book that summarizes a lot of the eco-game-related research we've been doing over the past uh, three years. And we are also uh, started a smaller side project called Green Mediography, uh, which uh, reports on different forms of eco-media, of green media, so that can be games, but uh, also include uh, other forms of media, like more established uh, um, genres, such as uh, eco-cinema or uh, green television, uh, but also photography and performative arts, um, and uh, tries to approach the subject from an inherently uh, media comparative perspective, which is also a bit what I aim to be doing with my talk today. So let's jump right in. Um, I will divide this talk into four sections. First, uh, define a little bit what I mean by eco games, by meta gaming, and also where I see the connections to uh, documentary traditions or concepts of documentary, which is not a field that I come from, but I'm trying, especially in this first part, uh, to um, already um, establish a possible connection that I see and that I would have liked to discuss during an actual uh, physical lecture. Um, then I will talk about the first of my two phenomena, eco-modding, then the second, in-game nature photography. And in the last part, I will talk a bit about practical consideration, what would need to happen to actually scale up these types of what I would call interactive documentary uh, practices. Um, and I will also talk a bit about political implications and other things that should be taken into account, how we can we evaluate the impact that these practices have, etc. All right, let's get started. So eco games is a topic like games that uh, can create awareness of ecological uh, sustainability, of sustainable futures, etc. It's a topic that has gained a lot of attention in recent years. I don't plan to give an overview of this field here by all means. Uh, one important book that has come out last year is uh, Benjamin Abrams' Digital Games After Climate Change, which you can see down here, uh, which um, shifts the perspective uh, away from the games as texts that represent ecological phenomena towards the games as material objects that have ecological implications that are made of matter that is often produced under precarious circumstances and which also creates other concerns when it comes to um, um, the waste that is created by other games or also the energy that is consumed by contemporary gaming technologies such as game streaming, etc. So, um, but uh, generally uh, nature, the climate crisis and also sustainable futures is something that you see more and more in commercial gaming. Um, games like Terra Nil, for example, which are all about uh, concepts like rewilding, uh, trying to present an alternative uh, towards uh, hypercapitalism and its uh, devastating impact on our uh, natural environment. So defining eco-games in itself is, of course, a political issue, uh, like what do you um, uh, subsume under this heading, what do you exclude? Uh, I won't go into this in very much detail, uh, but there are multiple competing frameworks, frameworks such as environmental literacy, 
eco-identities, eco-narratives, eco-literacy, some of which I will be briefly touching about in my talk as well. And what I'm specifically interested in as well is also what I call uh, this understanding of nature as a kind of franchise. If you look into recent games, especially board games, for example, you see that often there are games that function similar to older games, really, but they have a new coat of paint, they have uh, environmental motifs, narratives, um, pictorial traditions uh, that um, often create some kind of um, link to intact natural environments, such as in Cascadia, which was the Spiel des Jahres um, last year, in 2022. And this, I believe, can also be very ambivalent because on the one hand it creates exposure to these themes, but on the other hand it also commodifies a bit their reception. It is something that we kind of expect from now on, and that might also dull our um, awareness of the problems that these games uh, raise or hope to raise. So Benjamin Abram also talks about the persuasive limitations of eco-games. If somebody doesn't believe in climate change, playing a game might not convince um, them otherwise. So what he says, he says an interaction model of climate communication is needed. And that does not mean interaction in the sense of playing a game, but interaction in the sense of um, using the game as a means of interacting with others. And that is why I'm interested in metagaming as something that I call creative documentary practice. And I will uh, give you an overview of what I mean by metagaming. So metagaming, ecological metagaming, but also metagaming in itself uh, can be defined in a couple of ways. There are also examples of different ways uh, how it is defined. In game studies, you find this book that I've uh, referenced at the bottom by Stéphanie Bolluc and Patrick Lemieux about metagaming, which is a yeah, quite foundational uh, book about this concept, which also goes into a lot of different examples. The definition that I'm most interested in, I will skip the first two here um, uh, to um, uh, save some time, but the definition that I find most relevant and that applies to the cases I'm looking into uh, today is making a game out of a game, as Bolog and Lemieux call it. So that essentially means using repurposing games as material for other things, either making a new game from an old game or making a video based on a game, or kind of subverting the game, trying to play it in different ways uh, in order to realize something as a thought experiment, for example. Um, so Bolluc and Lemieux talk about how video games are transformed from a mass medium and cultural commodity into instruments, equipment, tools, and toys for various purposes. And this is exactly what's happening in the cases I will be presenting today. And where could we see here a link uh, to uh, notions of the documentary or interactive documentary? So there is a bit of uh, research about games and interactive documentaries. For example, uh, the article by Dana Galloway and colleagues uh, from 2007 um, talking about games like JFK Reloaded, which at the, same, at the time uh, presented themselves as uh, quasi-documentary formats. And the authors here talk about neorealism that can be portrayed in real time. They also refer to dramatic techniques of engagement employed by the latest documentary films. So they define a bit how games could be seen as documentaries by comparing them to documentary films, to the kind of stylistic devices that they employ uh, to uh, the realism, like temporal displacement, time is an important factor in this case. Uh, but I personally find this definition, especially if we're looking at contemporary games, a little bit uh, restrictive. So I would like to add two additional considerations. One is the notion of indexicality in games and also game making. So do games contain something that has an indexical relation to something in the real world? That would be a game where the topography is created uh, from a real world map for example, using techniques like photogrammetry might also allow for an element of indexicality in games. Uh, but also something that could be called performative realism, even, even if games present environments that are not real, that present fictional scenarios, uh, the context in which uh, they have been created uh, might have an important performative connotations. And one game that has always stood out to me in that regard is uh, What's Up in, Kar in a Kharkiv uh, Bomb Shelter, which you can see here on the top left, a very simple game created in a uh, very accessible uh, tool. 
that anybody could use that was created by a Ukrainian uh, youth in a Kharkiv bomb shelter. So this person was trying to take off their mind from the horror around them uh, by using a laptop, I presume, to and this very accessible game making tool to process uh, their um, experiences uh, in this uh, abstract uh, but also emotionally resonant um, way by making a game. So these two uh, concepts I consider quite important also when we would discuss um, the examples I present today. And then uh, there's Kate Nash's definition of simulation as interactive documentary practice, specifically the notion of documentary practice, which emphasizes uh, the importance of subjectivity that documentary objects uh, obviously do not come from a, um, from a production context uh, devoid of subjectivity, uh, but that uh, like Acknowledging and working with subjectivity is an important aspect of interactive documentary practice. And this uh, shift towards documentary practice and the acknowledgement of subjectivity are two important um, aspects to apply to these cases I want to present uh, today. And finally, practicing um, a documentary view. This is also a concept I personally find quite useful. It was originally applied to amateur documentary filmmaking. Uh, as you can see in the literature reference on the bottom. Uh, but what it does is it focuses on ways of looking that are practiced in amateur documentary filmmaking. So it's not about the films as objects that emerge from these practices, but it's really more from training specific ways of looking at your environment. And this is something that supposedly can also apply in virtual environments that are admittedly not real. And an interesting example of this uh, is an artistic project that is called Down and Out in Los Santos, which you can see at the bottom there, uh, which is an uh, attempt of a documentary photographer to take photographs within the game GTA 5, Grand Theft Auto 5, to document uh, the uh, marginalized groups, uh, impoverished people uh, who are part of the scenery, really. They usually don't play a role in the game's um, missions or um, like uh, uh, obligatory uh, activities, but that are um, something that you notice if you retrain the way you look at the game environment. And this is an interactive, well, thought experiment, also an experiment with oneself to see uh, what how can you train yourself to see uh, the game differently and maybe also apply these different ways of looking uh, to the real world. All right, um, coming to the first of my two case studies, and I will go through these a little bit quickly because I think the most interesting part is really to um, think about these phenomena uh, and how they apply to these definitions that I've presented before. So, uh, why eco-modding? Um, in uh, green media studies, which is the field that I'm working in, uh, there is kind of a consensus that we need different narrative schemas to really talk about the climate crisis as well as sustainable futures. So that means, for example, Corinne Donnelly, she talks about uh, that a lot of the, um, well, environmental media, also films that could be categorized as eco-cinema uh, employ narratives that revolve around conflict, progress, and direct intervention. So often a male protagonist, uh, even though that is gradually changing or um, diversifying, uh, but they are fighting against nature, against the giant wall of watery doom, for example, as it's called on the website tvtropes.org, fighting against, uh, well, the ramifications of natural degradation or fighting against other people in hopes of saving uh, their loved ones uh, from uh, environmental catastrophes. Uh, another motif, progress, so it's all about uh, developing the technologies needed uh, to deal with uh, nature that is running rampant. And finally, direct intervention, the idea that we can do something directly to combat, to fight the climate crisis, uh, as well as this kind of martial uh, rhetoric that's associated with these uh, narrative schemas. So Dondi says we need new narrative paradigms. Uh, so these could be, for example, circular narratives, narratives of degrowth, so narratives in which the 
characters don't necessarily progress, but also maybe um, uh, yeah take steps back. For example, they look for balance rather than um, uh, assuming a dominant position in which they are well equipped uh, to um, to uh, overcome uh, adversity. So uh, these are obviously not narratives that we regularly see in commercial media, uh, and games are no exceptions here. So the idea is, can modding, modifying commercial games, maybe be a way to prototype new eco-narratives? That's something I'm researching with students, for example. Um, and uh, another issue that is related to the one I just talked about is the need for new eco-personas. Just like we need new stories, we also need new characters uh, to inhabit uh, these stories. So there is some literature on eco-heroes and also eco-villains, for example, in commercial cinema. Um, and yeah, this literature already acknowledges a bit the cliches that are associated with these types of characters, characters like Lisa Simpson, for example, or Poison Ivy as so-called uh, environmental, um, well, eco-heroes, eco-villains. Um, but uh, these do not really offer identification options that resonate with contemporary audiences. And uh, there should be different types of characters that actually mean something to us in a different way and that also uh, work for um, different types of demographics uh, than the existing characters, which is also something that commercial media are ill-equipped to do, but modifying um, uh, commercial media, commercial games might be a way uh, to take a step in that direction. So eco-modding um, has been studied, for example, by Kyle Matthew Bonicki as a form of textual extension, as a form of, um, well, yeah, creating paratexts almost to existing games like The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, which you can see on the left, which are um, uh, examples of mods that Bonicki talks about. Uh, and he says that these mods uh, accentuate gaps in the game as a model. So, for example, this is a mod um, that's called Trash Cans of Skyrim, which addresses the fact that a lot of players in the game usually drop all the stuff they don't need wherever they go, it, it miraculously disappears. So this uh, creator just added these trash cans in the environment to say, well, this is something we should maybe think about. There should be places where we collect this stuff so it can be reprocessed. This is not part of the game as model, but the mod suggests it should be, and maybe even well, provides a very simplistic uh, way how this could be done. Uh, there are also other more elaborate mods, for example, the Spriggan Matron follower, which uh, imagines kinship with and hybridization of the environment with in-game characters, meaning that the Spriggan characters, which are anthropomorphized plants and normally only appear as enemies in the game, uh, that with this mod they can also act as followers, so they can also become a companion to the player character. And that, of course, uh, yeah, com complicates a little bit the personal um, relationship towards nature as presented in this game. Uh, what I find interesting about eco-modding is that it is an inherently rhetorical process. It's a form of speaking back to the game, and that's also how I uh, look at it, uh, describing it as an ongoing critical discourse. So for me, more interesting than any individual mod is really the rhetorical operations that happen uh, through different mods. For example, I can give this first example, uh, Renewable Energy Complexity is a modification for Civilization VI Gathering Storm. And in this game, it's a simulation game uh, that uh, presents um, the um, origins of a civilization. And this expansion of the game added a um, climate component to the game. So there's climate change, there are uh, renewable energies and other elements that the player can use uh, in their playstyle. And um, the way this mod operates is it makes uh, renewable energies in the game uh, and also the drawbacks of not using them much more gradual. So you don't notice really if you rely on fossil fuel, for example, you notice don't notice for a longer time uh, that you might be causing problems. And that means when these problems finally surface, it is all the more difficult to deal with them. 
so what the mod is essentially saying, the way the game presents uh, uh, renewable energies is not correct. It's just too easy, too easy to diagnose, too easy to react to. This needs to be much more gradual as in the real world and therefore also so much more difficult to actually deal with uh, in practice. So in this case, by tweaking the rules, the mod uh, provides, uh, well, challenges a statement made by the original games and also presents a, uh, an alternative, um, a way that is, according to this person, uh, more, um, more compelling as a rhetorical argument. So there are a couple of rhetorical operations. I won't go into detail here uh, about them, but just to give exam a few examples, affirming. So if you incorporate procedures that are already in the original game and embed them more deeply into other systems, you could also affirm a procedural argument that the original game already made. You can also try to delegitimize um, or to formulate an alternative uh, to the procedures, to the rhetoric in, built into the original game. And what we also see uh, only recently is that in eco-mods, in these eco-critical modifications of games like Civilization, for example, uh, we find increasingly reactionary comments as well. So there is a mod called Reduced Global Warming, which argues that global warming in uh, this game uh, is far too severe, it is constraining, it is not, uh, it is moralizing, it is not really what it should be, and it should be reduced in a specific way to, to be more realistic and avoid a certain kind of preachy tone, a certain kind of rhetoric. This is something that we also try to use uh, as a teaching heuristic, uh, starting with so-called map modification, so make creating environments which are a lot easier to make uh, than modifications that actually change the rules of a game, and that involve principles of environmental storytelling. One example I skipped over uh, two slides before, I think, uh, but that's a very common uh, mod for civilization is Iceless and Arctica, and it's based on um, El Gore's um, idea of Antarctica at some point in the near future uh, having lost all its ice caps and what would happen then? What kind of civilizations might try to lay claim to Antarctica? Might uh, Is Antarctica at some point becoming more livable than some of the areas of the world that uh, are most densely populated at the moment? What kind of political struggles might come from this future scenario? And that is something that you can quite easily build in the game and have people uh, play, actually, and uh, use it as meta the metagaming definition uh, suggests as material to stimulate discussion. So it's not about playing this game, but tweaking this game as a resource uh, to stimulate a particular uh, kind of um, productive discussion. Fortnite is another game that we are using for this purpose, but I will skip this here uh, to save some time. Uh, because it is a different version of the same ideas, actually. So I would like to come to my second example, which is in-game nature photography. Again, we see, uh, coming back to these deficits that I started with when I talked about eco-modding, apart from new narratives and new characters, what we also need is a type of new imagery, new visual imaginary of uh, climate threats, but also sustainable futures. So at the moment, you will see uh, that there is quite a bit of visual homogenization that is used to communicate certain ideas about the climate crisis. Especially if you look at corporate visual communication or stock art, you will see that a lot of the images uh, shown are very, well, uh, self-similar and uh, they are taken for granted. Uh, so they actually waste the potential of the visual medium to contribute something of import. And uh, these pictorial traditions can even be problematic. So for example, Wendy Beattie in her PhD thesis on, on landscape photography, she talks about the need to move beyond the natural sublime and the picturesque and colonial gaze that is inherent in traditional nature painting and nature uh, photography. So similarly, what we need is alternative types of images, which are, again, in commercial media, often um, few and far between. Uh, 
um, because uh, of the st stakes of creating a very complex uh, commercial uh, media product. So um, I want to briefly talk about the link between nature photography as a documentary practice and uh, what it has done for um, environmentalist movements, for ecological thinking. So there are a, a few studies about this that I've been um, engaging with, which also talk about amateur historical photography as a precedent uh, to amateur nature photography, also which was already a collective process, collectively imagining the past. It also talks about effects uh, being a source of pride of national identity. And similar sentiments also apply to amateur nature photography. And uh, Jerry Cronin talks really about how nature photography was instrumental for the rise of national parks, for the uh, emergence of conservationist movements, because it created and homogenized a shared imaginary of nature, which Cronin uh, describes as a wilderness industry. So there's already a critical element here. And uh, so that means uh, these photographic practices, especially democratize, democratizing these practices, creates a, um, a shared visual understanding of nature that um, uh, affords uh, a lot of public support for conservationist uh, movements. Um, and uh, Drake in 2014 uh, applied this idea to a more contemporary setting. So she worked with undergraduate photojournalism students um, and uh, looked into how spending time outdoors, engaging in nature, amateur, amateur nature photography, um, helped them develop what she calls an ecological self, something that is elsewhere also described as ecological identity or eco-identity. And this is something that, um, well, inspired me to look at in-game photography as a potential source of a similar personal transformation. Uh, I already talked about Down and Out in Los Santos, which is an example of in-game photography, in this case, photographing uh, the um, uh, homeless people in um, the streets of Los Santos, the in-game environment of Grand Theft Auto V. Um, and there is quite a difficult discourse around in-game nature photography, so especially, well, nature photographers, uh, they uh, find it difficult to accept this, what they call a new art form, as uh, being photography. So some people say, well, this is art, clearly, uh, but it is not photography. <laughs> and there are interesting arguments uh, that are put forth about why this is or is not comparable with actual photography. And some of them actually don't really hold water. For example, one nature photographer argued that being in nature with all of the danger and infinite variability that comes with it is not comparable uh, with um, uh, being in a game. And that might be a point that is relatable. There is not really a danger uh, involved, at least not to oneself, only to one's character in a game. And infinite variability, that is already, of course, a kind of romanticized um, uh, description of a real-world natural environment. Uh, but some of these arguments... Uh, well, for example, this idea of serendipity, of me moving around the world and trying to happen upon uh, the perfect motif or the perfect angle on a particular visual motif, uh, these also apply to commercial games in recent uh, years. And uh, so this, um, well, discursive environment is not, well, inherently important for in-game nature photography and its potential impact. Uh, but it is useful to be aware of it. And these are a couple of examples on in-game nature photography websites, all taken from the game Red Dead Redemption 2, as you can see, uh, that showcase a bit um, the kind of visual aesthetic um, that these photographers are going for. And at the same time, they also showcase already a bit, a few of the problems. So they're all very beautiful. Uh, but they're also a bit limited. They are not really alternative imaginaries, right? So, uh, and that also means, if you remember Beatty at the beginning, that they might just replicate uh, these uh, neo-colonial ways of looking at nature, uh, of romanticizing uh, natural environments. So in Red Dead Redemption 2, the game environments have 
actively been inspired by techniques of landscape painting, the way how fog is handled, how um, um, reflections are handled, for example, volumetric lighting, color grading, etc. Uh, and specifically, the Hudson River School has been an important reference point for the designers in creating their environment. And the thing is that the nature photographers of these games often can remediate again uh, these Hudson River School traditions, these 19th century, early 20th century pictorial traditions uh, that were built into the game. So they don't try to go beyond them, but to replicate them, which might also have a personal transformative impact possibly, uh, but uh, they also make it quite difficult uh, to imagine nature differently through the in-game camera. These are arguably less beautiful screenshots uh, that we took from a quick workshop uh, with students at a summer school from the game Skyrim, which also in and of itself is also not as visually compelling as Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, but what we tried was also finding ways of thinking beyond the natural sublime. And um, it takes a while to do that, actually. So most of our students also, as you can see, try to replicate a certain idea of the natural sublime that is so familiar to us from movies, from photographs, from paintings still. Um, so um, uh, it is something that is very difficult to move past, right? And then you find a few students trying out things, trying unconventional angles, trying to uh, to focus on very small details like the singular butterfly here um, and uh, put the rest of the environment in the background. So these techniques are also not altogether new, but what is kind of new is that in, this, in these virtual environments, uh, a lot more people might be able to, uh, to get exposed to these techniques, to these practices. Uh, with the aim, hopefully, of uh, inspiring them to also take them into uh, the real world and uh, think about uh, their natural environment through the viewfinder of a camera. In-game videography is another phenomenon again, which is also something that might go a little bit beyond our topic today. So instead of just photographing uh, virtual environments, uh, there are a few groups uh, that actually uh, remix nature documentaries using games as material. So these are two examples. Uh, one comes from the game Grand Theft Auto V again. There are two, I believe, or even three nature documentaries, one Into the Deep, which is what this uh, screen, where this screenshot comes from, and one is called Onto the Land, which is about the marine and the land animals. And they really remediate the David Attenborough style of nature documentary. They almost parody it, but they're not meant to be really parodies, more tributes or an homage to this specific style of narrating uh, nature and also capturing uh, natural phenomena. Uh, and um, the second example is from a game called Destiny 2, which is interesting because Destiny is not a game set on Earth, but is a science fiction game with a lot of fantastical environment. Uh, but the people making these movies apply the same kind of narrative processes they are familiar with from the Attenborough documentary to these virtual worlds. Uh, so they're developing a way of, you could say, interactive documentary gaze at these in-game environment, and they're trying to look for these alien, to look at these alien species in a similar way uh, that David Attenborough presented uh, animals uh, here on Earth. So they're translating, I would say, this genre from a set of criteria into a replicable practice, into something, uh, they're deconstructing it, uh, they're looking at aspects of narrative structure, but even the tone that Attenborough uses to uh, the vocal qualities um, that characterize his documentaries, so they're distilling it down to these parts and then using them as a means of uh, looking at these virtual natural environments. And this is also something that can be uh, used as a teaching heuristic. Again, I will not go into too much detail here, uh, but there are different ways how this could be applied, indeed performing the perspective of a real-world nature photographer, similar to what we have experimented with in Skyrim, uh, and also looking at how real-world, uh, for example, animal photographers um, 
uh, look at uh, their motif. So this is an example of a National Geographic photographer explaining how they um, document uh, their uh, objects, in this case a cat. So for example, you have to see the eyes. You always need, if you're taking animal photographs, you need to have the eyes pointed towards the camera to create uh, a, a relationship between the viewer and um, the animal, for example. So these kind of, um, well, unspoken rules um, uh, people can experiment with in games, try to replicate, and thereby also experience why these rules are put in place, why they have become so common. Uh, and a different approach would be to unsettle uh, landscape photography, to use, uh, to find um, ways to go beyond the nat natural sublime. So this is an example of Andreas Gursky's um, photography, Tokyo Stock Exchange. So Andreas Gursky, um, who is mentioned in Carolyn Kane's uh, article, The Toxic Sublime, he uses landscape photography, the principles of landscape photography, to document man-made scenes, like the Tokyo Stock Exchange, for example. So these could be alternative practices uh, that can be applied in a workshop, for example, in a game, to see how can we uh, systematically uh, denaturalize these natural phenomena, and thereby maybe also practice a different way of looking at them and maybe overcoming these fraught uh, traditional ways of perceiving nature. Which brings me to my last few practical considerations. I will also distill these down to the um, uh, most important ones. So first, uh, this is less relevant for us here, but uh, this remediation of um, real-world green practices, as Tanya Lewis calls them. So that would mean, uh, for example, nature photography uh, in games uh, is not limited to photography. So there are other forms of uh, metagaming practices, uh, notably community gardening, uh, but many more, which uh, have similarly been remediated in games. For example, community gardening has become quite popular as a virtualized uh, practice uh, during um, the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdowns in games like Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing New Horizons. And the question there emerges as well, does virtualizing these practices uh, still uh, allow for participants to harness their potential? Are they still green practices if you practice them in virtual environments? Which is an interesting question that still is somewhat undecided, also as it applies to um, in-game nature photography, for example. A second important aspect is the politics of metagaming. So uh, you can just, uh, with the press of a button, take a screenshot of a game. But most people who engage in nature photography do so uh, via dedicated photo modes offered by the games. And these modes are, of course, uh, well, meant as a form of catalyzing user engagement, but they are also marketing tools. Often these are used in very beautiful looking games and they're meant uh, uh, to um, use players as uh, multipliers to um, show the beauty of this environment and encourage others to uh, try to play these games as well. Um, so there's always, um, as with all, I would imagine, um, documentary practices, the question of tools, of politics built into tools, tools both for the production of these metagaming um, uh, objects but also tools of distributing them. Like, where can you find this stuff? A lot of these practices I talked about today are still quite marginalized. They are practiced by smaller groups, and as such, their cultural impact is notably limited. Uh, and that brings me to the last two important issues, namely how to assess these metagaming practices. So there are established concepts that I mentioned before, environmental literacy, ecological literacy, eco-literacy, all of these point to important skills and uh, knowledge domains uh, that are necessary for sustainable transformations. And so these could be used as a first benchmark to see do these metagaming documentary practices uh, positively um, impact any of these um, uh, criteria? 
And then there are also functions of documentary, of course, of documentary practice, creating artifacts of one's time, heightening public sensitivity towards certain societal challenges, historiographical commentary. This is something I would have loved to discuss, actually, what other functions of documentary as a societal, as a cultural practice are there, and can these metagaming techniques um, make a contribution here, or are there any epistemic uh, discrepancies uh, that we should be aware of? And finally, uh, for me, the most important question right now is how can we scale up these practices in a way that still makes them or allows them to remain sustainable, but that maximizes the potential societal impact uh, that they have. So for this, I think we really need three things in particular. So the first one is active and self-sustaining communities of practice. If it's only individual people who engage in these, who make eco-mods, eco who take um, landscape photographs in games, uh, then they will always remain isolated in a way. But if there's a community that can, a community of practice that can uh, share knowledge uh, with newcomers, for example, that can uh, valorize particularly interesting examples as output of the community, etc., uh, then there's a much stronger um, uh, motivation to actually participate in these practices oneself. Uh, second, the question of tools, accessible and flexible tools, both to produce and to distribute um, these uh, metagaming uh, objects. And finally, distribution channels and platforms uh, that create uh, public outreach, that bring these kind of mods, images, etc., into the popular imagination and solve these issues or help solve these issues that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, create ideas for new eco-narratives, for new eco-personas, for new eco-imagery, -imager etc. And that might also provide a back channel that allow for commenting on these uh, objects that stem from um, eco-metagaming practices uh, and that allow for people to critique or maybe to uh, respond uh, to certain um, uh, images, mods, etc. being created. Only then this interaction model of climate communication uh, that Benjamin Abram called for, uh, which I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, can uh, really be uh, put into practice. And that marks the end of my talk. I hope you found this um, entertaining, instructive. And uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments, feel free to email me anytime at s.verning at uh, uh, uu.nl. And uh, thanks for your attention.